Welcome to our latest episode, The Art of Structuring Distribution Provisions in Trusts and Foundations. In this episode, I'm going to discuss why many people's lack of understanding leads to basic trust distribution provisions aren't beneficial to sustaining long-term wealth. And I'm going to tell you how you can better structure distribution provisions to ensure the financial security of future generations. Welcome to the Wealth Uncensored podcast, straight talk about everything that impacts your wealth. In each episode, I share what I've learned through my own experience and two decades of helping high net worth clients structure their affairs to minimize taxes and protect their assets for the next generation. I'll also feature special guests who are experts in their own field, sharing their knowledge and experience to help you protect what's yours. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton, Let's dive into today's show. So most people considering setting up a trust or foundation have a pretty basic view of how beneficiary distributions work. For example, when I die, assets should be distributed to these people in these amounts. While this may be okay for small trusts and foundations, if you're a high net worth individual protecting significant wealth with a trust or foundation, this is not what you want for several reasons. First, assets in the trust or foundation that has defined benefits for beneficiary. So for example, beneficiary A gets 25%. This can have significant asset protection and tax risks. And here's why. There's an asset protection risk because the beneficiaries can be considered the owners of their defined part of the trust. So if they're, in the example that I gave, in their 25% interest in the trust. There's also a tax risk because beneficiaries can be considered by tax authorities to be the owners of their respective parts of the trust and can be liable for income taxes. So going back to my, my example where you have a beneficiary that has a 25% beneficial interest in a trust, the tax authorities could say, well, you own 25% of the trust, therefore you're liable for taxes on 25% percent of the trust's income. So that's obviously while the assets are still in the trust before the beneficiary has received it, right? But what happens once the heir receives the distribution? So you die, the trust distribute it. Now those assets belong to the heirs. Well, they own the assets now, right? Which means there's no asset protection because the assets now belong to the heir. They're liable for the income taxes on the income generated buy that wealth because it's theirs. And if you live in a jurisdiction or if they live in a jurisdiction where there's wealth taxes, they're also liable for the wealth tax because it's their asset. And if they die and pass those assets on to their heirs, potential estate and gift taxes to be paid. There's a better way and I'm gonna tell you what it is. So if you're a high net worth individual with significant wealth, what you really want is a multi-generational structure where your assets aren't distributed upon your death. Rather, the assets stay in your trust or foundation and the beneficiaries of the trust or foundation, for example, are you and your bloodline heirs. That means that anyone descending from your bloodline is automatically a beneficiary, which means your kids, your grandkids, grand grandkids, and so on can all benefit. In, in a structure like that, the assets stay in the trust or foundation and future beneficiaries can benefit from that wealth in the form of distributions from that trust or foundation. Now, this multi-generational structure with the assets stay in the trust or foundation, but future generations can benefit from the trust or foundations has a lot of benefits in general for beneficiaries. So there's tax benefit, there's asset protection benefits, there's built-in estate and succession planning because beneficiaries don't actually own the wealth, the trust foundation does, right? In such a multi-generational or dynasty structures, they're generally discretionary, meaning that the beneficiary distributions are at the discretion of the board of the foundation, right? So there's no beneficiary that is entitled to a specific portion of the trust or specific distributions for the trust. Rather, the distributions are at the discretion of the trustee or the foundation's board. So the board decides who gets what, when, and how much. That gives the board a lot of power. So those setting up the trusts and foundations want to think about 
placing some limits on the board's discretion, right? So despite what distribution criteria someone decides to put in their trust or foundation, most contain a provision, for example, that medical and educational expenses always must be paid and that everything else, for example, is at the discretion of the board, right? So the beneficiary wants to buy a car or buy a house or have spending money or something, then that would be up to the board to, to decide whether or not to distribute the money to the beneficiary for that. So the three most common distribution provisions that I see going to trusts and foundations are an age requirement, an education requirement, and substance abuse provision. So the age requirement is setting an age requirement for beneficiaries to receive trust distributions. This can help ensure that they have sufficient time to develop responsible financial habits and avoid misusing trust assets, right? You generally don't want to give like a 20-year-old kid like a million dollars, right? I mean, who knows what they're going to go out and do, right? So the most common ages that I see used is, is 21 and 25 as the age criteria to receive a distribution. Although I've also seen some uh, age requirements up to age 40, right? But I mean, there's wide latitude in drafting this, so you can put whatever you want. And sometimes it's tiered. So for example, when a beneficiary earns 25, they can receive distributions up to a certain amount. And then when they turn 40, distributions can be unlimited. Now, the second requirement is an educational requirement. So requiring beneficiaries to have a certain level of education, such as a high school diploma or more commonly a college degree, can encourage them to invest in their own long-term success and help ensure that they have the knowledge and skills to effectively manage the wealth that they receive. Like I said, the most common educational requirement is a college degree. I don't see many where it's, it's simply just a high school diploma. Now, the other one has to do with mental health and addiction screening. So a lot of times there'll be provisions in there for conducting mental health and addiction screenings on potential beneficiaries so that the trustee of the board can help identify under any underlying issues that may impact the beneficiary's ability or you know, how responsible they might be with the wealth they receive. Now, trusted foundations often contain clauses that if a beneficiary has a substance abuse or a gambling addiction, for example, or, or has a mental Ill illness, that distributions are then halted, except for distributions paid for treatment, until the beneficiary has recovered from whatever the issue was. Now, there's also some less common provisions that people use, but I, I think they're worth discussing, right? So one of them is an employment requirement. So sometimes requiring beneficiaries to be employed or to have a certain level of earned income can encourage them to develop a strong work ethic and avoid relying solely on their trust or foundation assets for financial support. This is also often used to help ensure that beneficiaries understand the value of money and don't become you know, degenerate trust fund babies. There's also you know, a lot of high net worth families are very philanthropic. And so sometimes there's a philanthropic giving requirement. So for example, requiring beneficiaries to make a certain amount of charitable contributions or you know, perform a certain amount of volunteer hours can help instill a sense of responsibility and community involvement. I see this mostly in trust and foundations set up by self-made people whose children grew up affluent and they want to ensure that you know, their, their heirs understand how the other half lives and, and how truly fortunate they, they are to have this wealth. There's also a potential you can consider putting in life skills, a life skills training requirement, right? So requiring beneficiaries to participate in training courses related to financial management, life skills, and other relevant topics can help prepare them for you know, the responsibility of adulthood and ensure that they have the necessary tools to effectively manage their wealth. In my view, this is actually a very important requirement, right? Many beneficiaries who grow up in affluent households have had the privilege to pursue their passions without really having to worry about money. The problem is they're often ill-prepared for handling the money when they get it. By putting these provisions in there, this can help ensure that they don't go squander what they get. I mean, I've even seen some stuff that's pretty out there, right? Like I'm aware of one trust that had a provision that any beneficiary who rode a motorcycle would automatically be removed as a beneficiary. I mean, that's pretty out there, but like I said, you have a, a, a wide latitude in how you want to draft these, these distribution provisions, what the criteria are, limitations, so on and so forth. Now, some people also want to make certain provisions for mandatory distributions, right? So we already talked about, for example, you know, mandatory distributions 
in, in the case of, of, of education or medical expenses, but you can also put stuff on there, right, that the trust or foundation should match a beneficiary's salary, right? Or that a certain amount of money is paid out when a beneficiary has their first child, or that a beneficiary gets enough money to buy a house or make a down payment on a house when they get married. I've also seen a case where that a beneficiary was entitled to distributions if that beneficiary wanted to get additional citizenship or residency that the foundation or trust would cover the cost. So again, there's really a lot of wide latitude in how you want to structure the distribution provisions. So I, I think when you're structuring the distribution provisions, you all obviously want to do it in a way where you know, the, the beneficiaries are, are going to be taken care of for the things that are important, that are, but they're also not going to be spoiled and, and, and potentially help them you know, start out their lives, such as you know, with giving them a house or a certain amount of money when they have a child. And you really need to think about your own personal values and philosophy and, and, and how you can work those in to the, the distribution provisions of, of the trust or foundation. So in summary, if, if you have significant wealth, do yourself and your heirs a favor and create a multi-generational structure with robust distribution provision. The tax benefits, asset protection benefits, and estate planning inherent in a multi-jurisdictional structure will provide financial security for generations to come. I hope you found this episode useful and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Thank you for joining me on Wealth Uncensored, where we help you minimize taxes and protect your wealth for the next generation. If you like our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at esquiregroup.com. And don't forget to visit Esquire Group's website for more information on how we can help you secure your wealth. I'll be dropping knowledge again next week. Don't forget to join us.